United. Hello, nerds. Welcome to History Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Today, we have author Stephen Collis talk about some of his books, including his new book coming out, Praying with the Enemy. Steve's a really interesting guy, very smart. I mean, the way he thinks about things is amazing. He actually writes a lot about religion, which usually is a pretty sticky subject for a lot of people, but the way he goes about it really makes it interesting without boring and also without ticking off a lot of people, which I didn't think was possible. Anyway, let's get to it. I'll shut up now. Podcast with Stephen T. Collis. Stephen T. Collis, welcome to the History of Nerds United podcast. Really appreciate you coming on. Hey, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So I think it would be not saying enough to just say author Stephen T. Collis, because you seem to have at least 17 other jobs, not including the family. <laughs> Can you just do a quick rundown? So what else do you do besides being an author? Sure. So I, I am an author, and then I'm also a law professor at the University of Texas, Austin, where I'm the faculty director of the Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center, and it's related law and religion clinic. Do you still do actual court cases or anything like that in that time, or is that just above and beyond? I used to be an equity partner at a major law firm, but I have... Uh, since given up my uh, my partnership stake. And so I, I, I am a faculty member full time at the University of Texas. Part of the law and religion clinic, which is part of what I direct here, uh, is to handle cases. But we, we allow the students to largely work on those cases with I, I serve in a kind of a supervisory professorial role to try to teach them about how to be good lawyers while they work on active law and religion matters. So I am involved in real cases, but it's through kind of the pedagogical lens of teaching law students. And then on top of that, I believe you are married with four kids, is it? We actually have five kids. Now five. Okay. Five children, and they keep us very busy, for sure. Do you sleep? Is it two or three hours, Max? <laughs> actually, sleep is one of those things I guard jealously, because it's the only way I can stay productive during the day. But there's no question, we stay very busy. I, I would much rather spend my time doing all the things that I'm doing and spending time with my family and kids and writing and exploring new things than, I don't know, what else would I do? I guess play video games or... I do, I do enjoy watching sports in my downtime. That's my one guilty pleasure, I guess. Now, can I assume it's, it's all the Texas teams or different places? No, I've only been in Texas like a year and a half. So I'm actually still trying to get into Texas, but the University of Texas football team has let me down so far. So uh, I spent a lot of time at football schools. I did undergrad at BYU, law school at Michigan. So we cheer for those schools. Spent some time at Stanford. So we follow Stanford a little bit. I'm hoping that the Longhorns will give me something to cheer for in the years to come. So uh, talking about one of your first books, well, at least that I read recently, is Deep Conviction, right? And something that goes through all of your books is the religious aspect of it, right? That religious freedom and things like that. Just from a high level, how do you even try and write something like that in today's day and age where, to me, it seems like everybody is just ready to be ticked off and to take the other side and say how somebody is wrong? I mean, religion in and of itself is very controversial, when you go into writing these books, do you just say, I'm going to say exactly what I'm thinking? Or do you take that into account to try and balance everything out as much as possible? I take it into account, but I also think that most of the anger and animosity people have come from misunderstandings, misunderstandings about what religious liberty is, misunderstandings about other people's religions, assuming that because other people have religious beliefs, they're dramatically different from ourselves, that, that kind of a thing. All of those are misunderstandings that I, I kind of hope to highlight and help placate a little bit in my writing. You take religious liberty, for example. The media, at the end of the day, their goal is to get clicks and bring in revenue, and I don't fault them for that. But that means they have to report on the controversial cases. Well, 98% of the cases out there that have to do with law and religion aren't controversial at all. And most people agree with the way they should come out. Many of them aren't even cases. They're just Churches or religious groups who are trying to navigate, you know, thorny zoning issues or complicated contracts or problems with their ministers, all sorts of issues that come up in the law and religion space that simply aren't controversial. But the New York Times isn't going to get new subscribers if they report on those. So they, they, they only report on the culture war cases, which leaves people with the impression that the only time religious freedom ever becomes an issue is when there's some big culture war matter at stake. The reality is, if you look at all the matters percolating across the country, the instances where religion and law matters actually intersect with culture war issues like abortion or LGBT rights is less than 2% of all of the law and religion matters that are actually percolating around the country. Most of it, I think, comes from just misunderstanding, quite frankly. And I think you really highlight that in deep 
conviction is you got four different stories, right? You've got the Catholic priest right at the dawn of the United States. You have an atheist. You have an American Indian. And then you have the very, very famous uh, Christian baker in Colorado turning away uh, the gay couple to make the cake for their wedding. Um, what ha- How did you decide to choose those four stories out of the very many of them? I mean, I think what makes it the four that you chose, what stuck to me was all four of these people involved in this never wanted to be part of it. They weren't looking to make a point or to go to the Supreme Court or anything like that. These were just four normal people who were going about their everyday lives and then had to deal with something and they took it head on. How did you decide to pick out these four in particular when you were writing the book? Well, I really wanted to show the breadth, depth, and timelessness of religious freedom law in the United States and how it really does protect everybody. You know, I have You've got this Catholic priest in 1813, New York, and then the very next story is about an atheist in 1960. Most people don't think that the same principles that might protect the Catholic priest would also be protecting an atheist in 1960, but the reality is they are. These same principles protect all of us, no matter our beliefs or non-beliefs. The case about Al Smith, who's the Klamath Indian man I wrote about, I initially wasn't going to write about that case, but it is probably the seminal case regarding the protections for the free exercise of religion, certainly since 1890. And I felt like there was no way I could really write about this without telling that particular story, because that case has really affected everything that's come since. And then uh, I initially wasn't going to write about Masterpiece Cake Shop. I was living there in Colorado at the time. I had access to all the parties. I could do interviews. I could meet with people. It was it was going up to the Supreme Court. And so it, it made for a case that I know was in, you know right at top of mind for folks, but I also had access to everything that was going on. So it made it much easier for me to bring the case to life. I wanted a modern case, one that was percolating right at the time, because I wanted people to see how these cases aren't new. The arguments the cake maker is making in that case is no different than the arguments that The Klamath Indian was making in 1990, that the atheist was making in 1960, and that the Catholic priest was making in 1813. Doesn't mean they should win, but it's the same legal framework that's being applied and that we're trying to figure out. It just keeps getting relitigated by a new generation of people who are facing different challenges as we progress through time. And with Masterpiece Cake Shop, I remember getting to that chapter, and you you know your first three stories. There's a hero there, right? And you're looking and you're saying, like, I hope this works out for him. I hope they're able to get it. And then you get to Masterpiece and it changes a little bit because they're almost all heroes. There's no villain. I mean, I felt by the end of that story in particular, I'm like, everybody kind of loses here, right? Because everybody has a point and everybody needs to be respected. But this gets to a very thorny issue of, you know, where does your rights end and my rights begin? and How should we act? And that was kind of a hard one to read just because you think, oh, man, like, I feel bad for everybody. Everybody kind of got a little bit of a raw deal at some point during the story. Yeah. And the challenge you have with those wedding vendor cases, first of all, there's not that many of them. Again, if you go back to looking at the media or or reading the major media outlets of the day, you would think that there's thousands of these cases percolating around the country. There's, you know, there's really not that many of them, but they present an interesting dilemma. We have two historic wrongs we don't want to repeat in this scenario. One is a, a historic wrong of denying people goods and services in places of public accommodation based off of immutable characteristics like race or or, or religion can be considered one, ethnicity, sexual orientation, right? So you don't want people denied goods and services. There's an odious history there. But there's also an odious history going back centuries of denying people the employment of their choice and sometimes the only employment they can do based on their religious beliefs. And you can go back centuries and find that as well. The English Test Acts forbade Catholics from, from being teachers, from being lawyers, from serving in public any public capacity from making any job that required two or more apprentices. And how do you then create a legal regime that ensures you don't repeat either of those odious wrongs? The reality is, I I do think there's a way to get there. I think you can have winners on all sides, but it requires both sides to be willing to compromise a little bit in terms of how they're protected under the law and try to achieve true equality in the law and not just an outright victory for one side or the other which right now is pretty much what the two sides are always trying to do is just get an outright victory. And that's unfortunate. 
Well, it's like you said, it's it's the best way to draw in ratings, right? Is to, you know, create that there's a hero, there's a villain, and there's nothing in between. When I was reading that story in particular, it reminded me, as far as facts and what people think actually happened, it reminded me a lot of when I read uh, Columbine, the book Columbine a few months ago, which is I went in there and I thought I knew the story. And by the time I got to the end of it, I'm like, I barely knew anything. I, I knew what I had heard in the media that they repeated it a bunch of times, and then I read the actual facts and went, wow, I was I was way off. And I was looking at this from a, a kind of a, the wrong lens. Do you get caught up in that too? Like when you first started digging into it, did you have a lot of things that you're like, hey, people were saying this out loud, but this was not actually what's true. Here are the actual facts. Not anymore. I get interviewed by too many people in the media who then skew everything the wrong way to to rely on <laughs> to rely on journalists' interpretation of facts, if you want me to be honest with you. Uh Anymore, I just simply assume that if I don't have firsthand sources, I can't really trust what I think is happening in any given case. I see that all the time on everything I get asked to work on. You know, reporters will call me up and ask for my opinion on some legal case. I'll, I'll give it to them. And then the next day, I'll see the story come out. And it's not, it's not even so much that I'm misquoted so much as just their presentation of what's actually happening in terms of the facts of a given case inevitably are either just the bare skeleton and not enough to really get the nuance, or they're just blatantly wrong. And I don't know why that is. Certainly not every reporter in the world does that. If there's reporters listening to your podcast, I don't want them to hate me forever. But I, I've just I've had enough experience to know that if you really want to understand a case and a controversy, you've got to do the work to dig into it. I play a joke on people when I speak around the country. I'll, I'll talk about historic principles of religious freedom. And I talk about something called the Puritan mistake. Basically, you know, we talk about the Puritans and we say they came to the United States for religious freedom. And that's true. They did. But the reality is they were interested in religious freedom only for themselves. As far as they were concerned, everybody else could just move out of Massachusetts. And so we call that the Puritan mistake. And, and I encourage people to try not to commit the Puritan mistake today. After I teach and lecture about the Puritan mistake for a while, I'll tell folks, I'll say, OK, let me list for you a number of cases that are percolating around the United States. And I'll tell them real briefly about each case, maybe a sentence on each case. And then I'll say, listen, if any of you just on hearing those sentences alone decided what you thought the outcome should be on each of these cases, you're probably committing the Puritan mistake. And then I'll pause and say, at least half of you are thinking, dang it, he got me. And, you know, inevitably you are getting people because they just hear, they hear LGBT couple cake maker and they decide who should win the case without learning any of the facts, without spending any time to try and understand who, what the arguments are, what actually happened on the ground. It just doesn't work. It's just, it's not a good way of going through life deciding things that quickly. Well, luckily, I was brought up Catholic, and they never make any mistakes whatsoever. <laughs> now, speaking of opinions, right, I think, especially for deep conviction, you play it straight down the middle as much as possible. I would say, though, there was one point where I could feel that you had strong thoughts, particularly about Justice Scalia. So two questions. Number one, why did Scalia come up the way he did? Could you explain it to an idiot like me, right? Like, what did he do? that perhaps might have drawn the ire of a certain author? Sure. Well, I don't know that I, I mean, I didn't mean to come off as being condemning Justice Scalia too much, certainly across his whole legal career. I mean, you know, the man wrote thousands of opinions, and I think each one needs to be analyzed on its own. So I'm not commenting about him personally in the book or even his career. What I did focus on that was a major problem in 1990 in the Employment Division versus Smith case is he announced a new constitutional rule for how courts and judges should review cases that involve the government burdening someone's religious exercise. And he did it without any input from the lawyers, from anyone, from anyone else. I mean, essentially, this case comes up to the Supreme Court and everybody thinks one rule should apply and everyone argues the case based on this one rule. And then we get this majority opinion that comes out five to four with Scalia and the majority that changes the rule. At least that's how most people felt at the time. Now, since then, there's a bunch of academics who argue that's not what happened, but I think they're mostly engaging in mental gymnastics. I mean, the reality was he pretty much changed the rule and he didn't announce to anybody that he was thinking of doing this. He didn't, he didn't raise it up. I mean, one thing the Supreme Court could have done and has done is say, hey, we're considering this other direction. We want the parties to brief it. We want academics to brief it and come in and give us their input on what they think this means. And they didn't do any of that. They just announced a new rule. And now, 30 years later, even right up with all the COVID cases, we're still trying to figure out what the heck that rule means. 
And that generally happens when the Supreme Court just makes something up without any help and guidance from lower courts and lawyers looking at it first. That's why I condemn it a little bit. So you will not confirm that he is your least favorite Supreme Court justice of the past 40 years? No. In fact, to be honest with you, my brain doesn't really work that way. I don't really have favorites or non-favorites among the justices. I think they're all human beings doing their best. And sometimes they reach conclusions or use logic that I think is sound. And sometimes I think it's not so sound, but I, they all seem like wonderful people. I, it's too bad. We, we probably could have trended with that list, but it's okay. We're going to move on to the next one. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not controversial enough for to get headlines. That's my problem. <laughs> well, it just means you're a good lawyer. You think that stuff through just like that. Like, uh, is anybody going to call me about this? I don't need it. Well, your next book, and actually the first one that I read was The Immortals, uh, about the SS Dorchester, uh, World War II, U-boat sinks it. There are four religious leaders, four chaplains on the boat. How did you come across the story, and how did you decide you needed to tell it? Uh, you know, I was in an office of a colleague, uh, well, an acquaintance, another lawyer, and he had on his wall a stamp from the 1940s of the four chaplains. And it said interfaith in action. And he briefly told me the story. This was years and years ago. I thought to myself, if I ever get the chance, I'm going to work with a publisher and bring that story to life. And other writers had done it, but I never felt they were as comprehensive as they could be. And I never felt they had really brought it to life as much as it really could be brought to life. And so I just, I put it in the back of my head and said, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. The four chaplains are well known, especially in military and, and certainly in chaplaincy circles, right? People know this story. They know it well. Most chaplains, part of their training is learning about the four chaplains. There's a four chaplains day that Congress has recognized and it's coming up on February 3rd. It gets celebrated every year. So people are aware of the story in some circles. I just felt like it needed to be brought to the attention of far more folks. And so after I learned it, I just had it in the back of my head that this is a story I'm going to write. And actually... I meant for the four chaplain story to be a part of my book, Deep Conviction. But as I got into Deep Conviction, I, I called up my editor and I just said, this really deserves just to be a book on its own. It'll take too many pages to bring this to life the way it should be. And thankfully, he agreed. And so we had a second book come out of the first. And it's very interesting. I liked how you set it up, too, because as we talked about religion, it just it hits people. It hits a button. In the very beginning, you just make it pretty clear, like, hey, we're talking about these four people. We're not getting into all the background stuff. We're not getting into religious stuff. It's about these, you know, four men believe something and they believed in their religion. They believed in people. And then you just give their biographies and kind of move on from there. Uh, was that something that, uh, again, does it come back to you in your head like, hey, I want to make sure that people understand we're not getting into all of the other stuff in the background that we're going to focus and put a spotlight on these four chaplains. And I don't want to forget either that, the, you know, there is a fifth person that you talk about extensively in this book who is also an amazing hero. He just wasn't a chaplain. Yeah, and, and we should spend time talking about Charles David for sure. I, as far as the chaplains go, what they are known for is setting their differences aside for a common goal that they could all agree upon and sacrificing for that common goal without sacrificing who they were at their core. None of them sacrificed their religious beliefs or practices or who their core identity was with their particular faiths ever. But they did find a way to work together right up until the last moment when they sacrificed themselves to save hundreds of sailors. That is the dream in many respects of being able to survive in a country like the United States. We are the most religiously and racially diverse country in the history of humanity. The only way we can keep going forward is if we can adopt a similar attitude to what they showed across our whole culture. And, and I wanted to bring that story to life for that purpose. Uh, I hate this next sentence is going to sound weird, but uh, Adolf Hitler gave me a tremendous gift <laughs> in the research for the book, because, you know, if you've read the book, you know, one of the things I found is that Hitler used to sit around in his bunker at night and while sipping tea and eating cake, just kind of pontificate on the world. And they had a guy in the room who would take notes of everything he said. And Hitler's prediction was that basically the United States is too religiously diverse and too racially diverse to survive. And a united Germany, united, a kind of a forced united Germany under Nazi rule will easily be able to crush a fractured country like that. And, you know, I thought it was great that people like the chaplains were able to take that prediction and kind of shove it back in Hitler's face and say, no, we can overcome our differences without losing our core identities. And that was crucial. 
How hard was it to actually gather information on each one of these guys? You know, they were very nondescript up until, you know, this e- event, right? You know, they were they were active, they were religious and things like that. Is it really hard to track down and do the research on people like this before these big events? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's tough. You got you to gotta find folks who already have information, lots of interviews. Uh, some are easier than others. Um, Clark Poling, for example, his father wrote kind of a biography of him after he died. So, so Clark Poling's father was a very well-respected and well-published minister. And he wrote a book about his son that provided a lot of details of his early life that might not have otherwise been available. But then it was, I spent days and days in places like the National Jewish Archives, the National Archives in D.C., talking with any folks who had memories or connections with these people, getting my hands on things like journals and letters that chaplains themselves had written, but also letters written about them, you know, and just trying to get as many of those sources as I could and then compiling them into a coherent narrative. It's not easy to do. Um, and moving, moving, if I could, do you mind if I just say a little bit about Charles W. David Jr.? Please do. That was the next question. You know, I didn't, I didn't know about him. His part of the story had never really been expanded on before. In any other books about this, no one had really talked about it much. There, and as, so as I was doing my research and working through the story, we had intended to call the book The Immortal Chaplains. And then I get to one of the secondary sources I had, had one paragraph about Charles David Jr., who had sacrificed himself to save about half of the men that the chaplains had already saved. So they're in the water, and then Charles W. David Jr. comes and helps pull them out of the water. And in the process, he gets pneumonia, and he died from it. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, this guy sacrificed himself the same way the chaplains did. His story needs to be told with the same depth. And so I called up my editor, and I said, look, I know I got like a deadline in like two weeks, but we need to change this. We need to move the deadline back. We need to change the title of the book. And you need to give me more time to dig into Charles W. David Jr.'s life. And thankfully, my editor agreed. We changed the title of the book from The Immortal Chaplains to The Immortals. And then I spent the next few months, really, just doing everything I could to dig into Charles David's life. I found his granddaughter. I found his nephew. I was able to interview them. They connected me with lots of other information that then helped me dig into their family history files. I found all the files of when his parents and grandparents and others immigrated from the Caribbean into the United States. And we were able to get our hands on that. Other other original documents, pictures of his wedding, things like that, and really start bringing him to life in a way that I hope did him justice. But it was fun doing all that research and just really exciting to learn so much about these people and their uh, wives as well. When you saw that he basically was a footnote in everyone else's story and you started digging into it, I think you look at it and the first thing you say is, well, he was not a white guy and maybe that's why all of a sudden he's a footnote. But at the same time, you can look at it and say, you know, the four immortal chaplains, right, that you were going to name it first. It's it's kind of, it's very catchy. It's very focused. They were on there. They all went down with the ship. Did you come up with an opinion on that, on why he was a footnote, or did anything come out to kind of point you in that direction? I think it's important to realize he was a footnote in the in the one or two books that had been written. My initial gut reaction was just, well, it's probably because of race. But the more I started looking into it and thinking about it, I think it's more complex than that. So first off, he received the exact same award that the chaplains did at the exact same time the chaplains received it. They all received the exact same highest level of metal you could possibly get for their sacrifices that night. And his wife went in Manhattan to the Coast Guard offices there to receive this medal, along with her son. And uh, there's great photos of them in there together. Uh, Wonderful and tragic all at the same time, because you know that her husband has died, you know, at the moment that he's getting this award. And then he's been recognized by the Coast Guard ever since. He's had a cutter named after him. So it's not as if it's not as if he was completely ignored. The difference, I think, is that the chaplains were each religious leaders of various religious communities who then worked very, very hard to keep their stories alive. One of the books out there was actually written by people who were like family members connected to the chaplains. And then there was another book written by a reporter who just didn't dig into Charles David Jr. much at all. And then, of course, I came along and did it. So 
I think it's certainly fair to say there could be a racial component, but I also think that the chaplain's connections to these various religious communities who then worked very, very hard over time to keep their stories alive, gave them more of a spotlight than what Charles had, who, who he wasn't as much a big part of any one clear like religious community that was going to keep his story alive at the same time, if that makes sense. I found the most amazing fact from the Immortals was when you started talking about the death rates for chaplains in World War II. I mean, you did not want to be a chaplain. It was one of the three worst jobs to have if you wanted to stay alive in World War II. I found that amazing. Yeah, it's unreal. I mean, you don't, I never really thought about it a ton until I really started digging into the chaplaincy. The most poignant thing I realized was that when, when the two sides are more in a battle or looking to kill each other. The chaplains are simply looking to go around and minister and help and uplift, right? So they're not looking to take out the enemy and they're not often even watching what the enemy is doing, which means they're at risk and they're running around, they're jumping into foxholes, they're on ships trying to encourage people, they're ministering to folks and it makes them very, very exposed. They're not allowed to carry weapons and it really puts them in harm's way in a way that really no one else faces at this, except for maybe medics. But at the same time, they're almost always exclusively people who that's what they want to do. They want to uplift others and they want to help others and they want to, you know, carry people through these horrific things they're going through. And now the Immortals didn't come out that long ago. And yet somehow you have another book coming out this year, Praying with the Enemy, right? Yes, Praying with the Enemy. And can you tell me just a little bit more about that? What was it? What draw you to that story? What made you decide you wanted to write it? Sure. So it launches in June, in case your, uh, your listeners are paying attention. This one's an exciting book. So 20 years ago, 23 years ago now, I guess, I, I, was living, I had a chance to live in Korea. I was in Korea for a while. And when I came home, I, I was in the basement of a university library searching around for books on Korea. And I came across this obscure out-of-print memoir about an American pilot in the Korean War whose plane malfunctions over enemy territory. It's all, it's all a true story. And he he has to eject over behind enemy lines. He breaks both of his legs, gets captured, and then realizes that he's probably going to die there because he can't escape. He, you know, he can't walk because both of his ankles are completely broken. He, of course, gets interrogated and deprived of food, and he's put in these horrible conditions. And then at the same time, there is a closeted Christian man who gets drafted into the North Korean army, whose only hope is to be able to try to escape to the South where he doesn't have to hide his religion. And, and one of the things the North Korean regime did pretty quickly was start eliminating various religious groups. Anyone that they thought would be, you know, in opposition to their kind of socialist ideals, they, were, they started eliminating. So he's got to keep his religion quiet. Anyway, I won't ruin the story, but these two men managed to meet each other and escape together and, and in just a, an amazing escape behind enemy lines and make it to the South together. Somehow they found one another, realized that they could be allied and uh, figured out a way to escape. And I just thought, if I ever get the chance, I'm bringing that story to life. And so after I finished The Immortals, I pitched it to my publisher. They were excited about it and we've gone into it. I mean, both of those got to get optioned for movies, right? Like that's it's ready made normally this is the point where i would say to you hey you know history nerd united is about selling history to people who don't necessarily think that they like it right to give them exciting stories and i normally would ask to go do kind of a pitch but i think you basically already did that so the next question is when should we expect the movie to come out and can i be in it <laughs> i so here's a here's news for you authors rarely get to choose who the actors get to be so sorry don't break my heart like that come on <laughs> i've already had some people inquire who are kind of on the movie side of things who are interested especially in praying with the enemy so you know i hope something comes of it but we'll see it's there's a million books a year that get published and they're always looking for what what will make for a profitable movie you know i think it could be a great story and i think it's the kind of story that is uplifting at a time when a lot of people could use some uplift a very happy ending, and I think it'd be a great movie. But like I said, I've already got some folks who are on the movie producing side inquiry about it. We'll see if it goes anywhere from there. And I'll tell you, just you normally see authors take at least two or three years in between books. Were you working on The Immortals and Praying with the Enemy simultaneously, or do you just write really fast? I was not working on them simultaneously, but, you know, the beauty of being a professor, and one of the reasons I wanted to be a professor is you get time to write. That's what I like to do. And so I work on legal scholarship, and I work on writing books like this. I had the story ready. I was excited to do it. So the second The Immortals was done, I pivoted to Praying with the Enemy and just kept working on it full bore till we got it finished. It's a really good point because your books, 
don't sound like a lawyer's writing them, right? Like you, you have that flow. It's interesting. You're focusing on these things, but at the same time, I of course have to assume that you can do those dry legal briefs where it's just this, 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 and this. Is that something you actually have to kind of do in your brain? Like, hey, I'm writing more exciting over here. I'm writing kind of more just straight facts over here. Or is it just naturally to you? This is what I'm doing and it comes out. Well, no, it is. I mean, it is a different genre and it's a skill you have to learn both ways. You have to learn both skills. I did, before I went to law school, I did an MFA in creative writing, which is also a three-year degree to teach you about writing skills. And so that's what I employ. It's that creative writing skill that I've tried to develop over time when I'm writing my nonfiction and my novels. And then, you know, it's a different style of writing when you're writing legal briefs. I would say, though, that there's much overlap in the styles of writing. I mean, in both instances, you want to be clear and you want to have good use of your sentence length and structure and punctuation and write in a way that is going to capture a reader's attention. But it is just a different genre of writing. So I'll ask one more question. I ask this of all authors, especially you guys were all very smart. I know you already admitted to sports. We've been locked down for a while. Everything's loosening up. Will you admit to the trash TV that you watch besides sports? The trash TV I watch besides sports. I, the only thing I can confess there is that I still use Seinfeld as like my comfort food. So I loved Seinfeld in the 90s. And when, I want, when I'm stressed at the end of the day and the kids are down and I finally just want to unwind, I will often just put on a rerun of Seinfeld. And that's how I unwind. That's not trash TV. That's classic TV. That doesn't count at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I was hoping for out of nowhere, you know, some Kardashian, some Love Island or something like that. Not that I've ever seen any of those. I've just heard those names before. It's not even on my radar. I do have a small group of friends who uh, regularly get together for parties to watch The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. But my involvement to that mostly consists of making fun of them through texting when they're doing it. So aside from that, I don't really, I don't, I don't really have my, my trash TV comfort food. I mean, now that you told that story, I'm not saying I don't believe you. I'm just saying I think you might have gone to one or two. You can admit you went one or two, right? You went for the food. I understand. <laughs> Let's see. This was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that's it for this episode. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Nerds, please go on out. Find us wherever you can. Social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, History Nerd United. Head to HistoryNerdUnited.com. Leave us comments. Send us ideas. We want to hear from you nerds. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, later. Later.